Our New Testament reading is found in the book of Acts and chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and, de and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. And there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail uh, into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young a uh, young man named Eutychus, uh, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and had eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos, and tarried at Tro, uh, Troglium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I am not ashamed to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember that by the, great, by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. 
I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Amen. Our text this evening is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, and verse 19. Lord willing, next Wednesday evening we will begin a, a new series of sermons here at our prayer meetings. But for this evening, I wanted us to take up this one last topic before we began a new series, which I think is very relevant to uh, the situation and setting that God has given to us as a congregation, having recently entered into this new building and with it into a new community that surrounds this building. It would be suitable for us to especially reflect together by way of meditation on these particular words. So Matthew chapter 4, let's read from verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So we're going to focus our attention on those words of Christ, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of, of men. You should note that both at the inception of Christ's earthly ministry and at the conclusion of his earthly ministry, he strikes the same note. Namely, his interest and priority in reaching the souls of men. Here at the beginning of his ministry, we see this exhortation that he desires to make his disciples fishers of men. Before, immediately prior to his ascension, what does he say? But go ye, therefore, into all the world, and do what? To preach the gospel, to teach the nations all the things that he had commanded them, to baptize them, and so on. And so at both ends, both bookends, at the beginning of his ministry as well as at the end, we see this recurring theme, the priority within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to take a vested interest in the salvation of sinners and the spread of the gospel throughout the whole world. But we'll focus our attention especially on this verse, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We see three things, first of all, something done by us, and then we see something done by him, that is Christ, and then we are provided with a helpful illustration or figure to instruct us in these things. So first of all, something done uh, by us, namely those two words, follow me. This is something done by us, to follow me, the Lord Jesus Christ says. This is our first duty, to be following the Lord Jesus Christ, to take up our cross, as Christ says elsewhere, and to follow him. It's discipleship, it's sacrifice, it is an earnest, exercised pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, acknowledging his lordship. We are separated from the world. We have been set apart. We are not uh, allowed to live, as it were, in this world and to be of this world. But rather, rather than this idea of being in the world and like the world throughout the week and then in church on Sundays, the Lord is telling us, no, our aim is to have fellowship with him perpetually, that this is our, our daily uh, priority, to walk in obedience to him. The reason that this is important is because of its connection with what it's attached to. Lack of interest, lack of concern, lack of burden for evangelism or for the spread of the gospel 
is first and foremost a heart problem. It's first and foremost a heart problem. It is not first and foremost a theological problem. That's, of course, attached to it. But it is not first and foremost a theological problem. So you have, you have this notion that uh, you, you hear um, in every generation and in every place. You know, churches that say, well, you know, God just isn't growing the church. God just isn't growing the church. Right? This is pretty familiar language. And that certainly can be true. It certainly is true. I mean, at times, the Lord is not growing his church. But what I would have you note is that it is inappropriate for anyone to say that while sitting smugly on the sidelines in our easy chairs, as, if it were, as, it, as it were, refusing to do anything about it, right? It's, it's one thing to say God isn't growing the church and for us to be in harness, you know, laboring in prayer and as God gives us opportunity uh, to see the gospel brought to others, it's another thing for us to be apathetic and saying, uh, such things. The Lord calls us to be praying and, and working. And so it's a heart problem. We can't, um, none of us, myself included, can hide cowardice or laziness or indifference or a lack of compassion for the perishing souls ar around us behind the high walls of a glorious theology. So we can't say we're Calvinists. God is sovereign and uh, God is going to call his elect and therefore we are free to be bystanders, as it were, for us to be disengaged from the duties and responsibilities that God has called us to. Those walls cannot protect uh, our, our sinful uh, inclinations. And we could go so far as to say, given the fact that the Bible requires us to have a vested interest in the spread of the gospel, both here and throughout the world, the Lord would despise our misuse of the doctrines of grace. And so Jesus is saying, first and foremost, we are to follow him. We're to follow the Lord Jesus Christ personally. What does that mean? It means loving what he loves, doesn't it? It means thinking what he thinks. It means doing what he does. And the Lord Jesus is telling us what he loves and what he thinks, and he's telling us what, what we are to be engaged in doing. Following him includes all of those things. This true holiness results from following the Lord Jesus Christ. And that holiness, of course, is Beautiful. We worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. When his holiness is found in us, it is also absolutely beautiful. And it has that dual effect, doesn't it, of, of both attracting and repelling. As I've said in times past, the angels stand before the Lord and they say, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And they're drawing near to his presence and his beauty, but they're also shielding their faces. There's that tension of both attraction, magnetic attraction, as well as a sense of being, having to be shielded from the glory of that. You know, when that holiness takes its imprint upon the souls of God's people, there's something similar. The ungodly find something very attractive about the Christians and simultaneously find something that repels them, something that wants them to keep at a distance uh, from them. But this is all a part of following uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing is something done by us, and it begins with the heart work of following Christ himself. But then secondly, there's something done by him. Jesus goes on to say, follow me, I will make you. Christ is doing something. This is something done by him. I will make you. In other words, the Lord first works conviction and conversion in us. He makes us recipients 
of his divine grace. And then we, in that grace, go forth with the message of the same gospel. So we, we sang from Psalm 51 at the beginning of this service. There is David uh, repenting over his wickedness with Bathsheba and, and Uriah. And I was drawing to your attention as we prepared to sing that text. Here is this, this inspired hymn of repentance, which is absolutely teeming with gospel truth. David is saying, grant me forgiveness, cleanse me, create in me a new heart, don't take the spirit away, sprinkle me with hyssop and I'll be clean. All of this language is full of the gospel. And he says, in essence, later on in that psalm, do all of this for me, Lord, and I will proclaim. I won't keep my mouth shut. I'll proclaim your, the glory of your grace. I will teach transgressors like me of your ways. And so the Lord works his grace in us, and that spills out into our, our own lives. Now, we obviously need to be clear that the ordinance of preaching belongs to the office that God assigned to it, right? The preaching office, the gospel ministry. And we by no means would propound that everyone is, is a preacher of the gospel. That would flag flagrantly contradict what the scriptures teach. But every Christian in their general office as a Christian have certain responsibilities with regards to loving what Christ loves and thinking what Christ thinks and doing what Christ says. And so what happens if you begin to put the pieces together? How precious is our salvation to us? How, how much do we prize it? How much do we really, really, really value this salvation that God has, has given to us? The Lord works his grace in us first. As recipients of that grace, we do prize it. And as such, it flows out our pores. It's who we are. And we can't somehow detach ourselves from that gospel of grace. Wherever we go, it goes with us. And our interest in it is therefore manifest. You know, you, you think about in other parts of your life, and I've used this no doubt before, you know the excitement you feel over little things. You know, ladies, you find a sale at the store, you know, some clearance item that you know others would have interest in. Or it could be a site on the internet, or it could be one of these new gadgets, you know, one of the new pieces of technology or a new app or, or something like that, a piece of information. What happens? You want to tell people. I mean, you put it on, you know, your Facebook page, you send emails, or you tell people, this is really cool. Um, I think this is notable. I think this is something interesting. And your desire, your interest in the thing itself compels you to express that interest. And the point is simple. Since we love the gospel and we really prize our salvation, it's going to spill out so that as we are in situations where we're talking about all sorts of other things in life, we can't help but talk about the thing that's most important to us in our life. This is the thing that's going to, to come out. And so we can't, as it were, we can't say that the thing we purport is most important to us in all of the world and never talk about it. For it never, as it were, to spill out. To never mention it? I mean, this is absurd. We have come to know the lo loveliness of the Savior, and we attribute that rightly to God's sovereign free grace. This is part of what gives us confidence in telling the gospel to others. We realize that God in his sovereign good pleasure is able with irresistible power to change hard hearts. And so there's a boldness that that cultivates uh, within us. You know, you, there's a sense of, of having a sense of all that this gospel can do with the Lord's blessing. If someone purchases a new firearm and they take you out to the fire range, whatever, and they load it up and they hand it to you, you have a sense of 
this is something significant. I mean, this has the ability to do something powerful and even, you know, dangerous, as it were. And you, you think accordingly, well, the gospel is this, is this wonderful blessing that the Lord has given to us that is overwhelmingly powerful with the Spirit's accompaniment. <clears throat> it is the power of God unto salvation. It is God's sovereign irresistible grace. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that brings this gospel to fruitfulness. And so the Lord is saying, I will make you. He's, this is something he will do. He's saying, I will do this in you. Now, we tend to object. In reform circles, perhaps not in our immediate circle as much as, as, as in other circles, people object, don't they? And it goes along these lines. They're thinking about the church in America, more generally evangelicalism. And they say, it's as if they, they, they would say, well, they have tons of false conversions. Well, should our response be, well, then we should have no, no conversions? That we want no conversions at all uh, among us? No, our desire is that the Lord would bring real ones through the preaching of a real gospel. Or we say, you know, they have the infamous they. They have zeal without knowledge. Well, do we therefore conclude that we should have no zeal for the things that are precious to the Lord? You know, we, we don't believe in, you know, some of the methodologies with the Romans road and Jesus has a wonderful plan for your life and the sinner's prayer and all those things. In other words, they have bad methods. Well, does that mean we should have no methods? Of course not. It means we should stick to the methods that God has, has given to us. And so none of this takes away from the primacy of preaching, but we have an obligation to be Christians. And that means speaking about the things we love to those that we have contact with, telling them the things with a measure of enthusiasm at times about what we have seen God do. The church is the instrument through which this takes place in the world. You read the book of Acts, and this is exactly what we see. The preaching of the gospel is being taken upward and onward uh, into new geographical regions. Churches are planted, and there's this spread that takes place. And historically, we see the same thing. I mean, you, you see it in the high points of, of church history, like in you know, the Reformation period. There's Calvin, and there's you know, Reformation in Geneva, and churches are established, furnished with, with biblical ordinances and officers and so on and so forth. The people are furnished and equipped with truth, not to keep to themselves. So the idea is not God gives me all these things and then I lock it under, you know, key in a safe deep down in my own self and I just hoard everything to myself. No. No. By no means. The truth that has been entrusted to us, we have some responsibility to communicate to others. That includes one another and the things that we're learning, but it also includes the great wide world out there. We have an obligation to do so, and you see in the best and brightest places in church history this sort of thing uh, flourishing. This is what God has and is doing with us. You have those who say, well, we need to focus on the culture. You know, focus on the, the culture first. But that's not the biblical model. Jesus says, go preach the gospel. Jesus says, go take the gospel to the nations. He doesn't say, sit back, wait for all of this political, socioeconomic, you know, cultural activity to take root and then bring Christ into it. Quite to the contrary. I mean, we've been reading as a congregation John G. Payton's autobiography. What, what was the model that you see there? The gospel is taken to these people, and that is what, by the help of the Holy Spirit, produces change in those islands, not the reverse. So something done by us, namely following him, something done by him, that is, I will make you. And then thirdly, this figure, this illustration that instructs us with regards to what he's calling us to, namely, fishers of men. 
So follow me and I will make you fishers of, of men. Now I, these men, Peter and Andrew, were professional fishermen. This is how they, this is how they made their living. This is how they obtained their bread and their needs. They were professional fishermen. I am not, not even remotely close to it. In fact, I'm probably one of the least qualified to speak about uh, the activity of, of fishermen and, and so on. But there are several things that you can glean even from a, a distance that I think are applicable in terms of qualities, uh, qualities that speak to what God calls his people to. There's a dependence, isn't there? There's a dependence upon the Lord. I mean, you, you can fish yourself crazy and never so much as see anything or get a bite of anything. There has to be dependence upon the Lord. In other words, we have to be trustful in the Lord. It also requires diligence. Diligence and perseverance in the work. And it also requires intelligence, being watchful. So those who are good at fishing and have gone with a a couple of experienced people like that over my lifetime, they know exactly where to go, when to go, what the conditions need to be, where the sun is and where the shade is and where all of the different variables are. There's a sense of watchfulness that is, is there. The Lord calls us to be fishers of, of men. And one thing perhaps that we can readily press on our own souls, and this is something we all need to be pressing on ourselves uh, from time to time. We at times want to indirectly blame God. We at other times want to blame our faithfulness. You know, we're holding to the truth and, you know, the whole truth. But here's the question. Do we fish? Right? We can blame God and we can blame our faithfulness and our distinctives or whatever else, and not be fishing. That's a problem, isn't it? I've spoken in the past about this notion of lifestyle evangelism, where people are supposed to learn the gospel by osmosis, by merely looking at us. And it is certainly true that the gospel changes us and that we are living epistles that show something of Christ to others. So we're not discrediting that. People don't learn the gospel by osmosis. People don't get the gospel by just staring at a person. The gospel is propositional truth. It comes to us in the form of scripture. It is propositional truth that has to be communicated as such uh, to people. Both our words and our deeds go together. Now, I'm not suggesting in any of this that God wants any of us to devote X number of hours to door to door, though I think door to door is an appropriate means of, of taking the gospel to those uh, in our community. All I'm saying is, you can stay exactly where you are right now. You can stay exactly where you are, in your circles of friends and in your neighborhood and in your workplace and among your colleagues, stay right where you are right now and open your mouth. That's the only difference, is to open our mouth. This is what is nearest and dearest to me in my life, and therefore it's gonna come out. This is what is exciting in our lives and what we're learning from the Lord and it's going to come out. And you look at the testimony that you see in the scripture, it's true. I mean, they're, they're, you know, we, we sing about it in the Psalms. Look at the great things that the Lord hath done for us, right? There's all of these uh, um, references to declaring God's praises among the nations, to declaring God's praises among the people and so on. And you see it exemplified in various places in the, in the scriptures. When, the, when you read church history, we always fixate on key figures. So if you're reading the post-Reformation period, and you're reading about what was taking place, there are these great figures, you know, some of the Westminster divines and the 
Scottish Presbyterians like Gillespie and John Brown of Wamfrey and mm -hmm. Samuel Rutherford and Andrew Gray and so on and so forth. And we fixate on those people. And partly because that's, we have material, biographical material on, on some of them, on many of them. But the fact is, you know, these men were laboring in churches full of godly people who were shouldering a witness. You know, it wasn't just that you had a few key leaders, you had the nation being turned in the direction of Christ. You had whole societies and cities that were running after the Lord. It was on the ground. It was the people that were uh, shouldering uh, much of, of these, th these things. And so there are, there are things for us to be reflecting on. I mean, every time the Bible is opened and preached, it speaks to us sometimes reminding us of things we know, reinforcing things that, uh, that we're making strides in, other times you know, pointing out things that need to be amended and, and addressed uh, in, in our lives. But I want you to think about a couple of things on this particular point this evening. We are in our stations and callings and within our restricted you know, places, fishers of men. And I want you to highlight in your own mind that word men. We're talking here about souls. We're talking here about real people who have immortal souls. Not just the people you like, not just the ones that have stuff in common with you, not just the ones that you talk to, all of these people that live in our community and those that we pray for and support on the mission field are souls that are perishing around us, that are in this world without hope and without God, who are running as fast and furiously as they can to hell. That ought to have some weight with us. It ought to have a sense of weight with us. You know, one of the things that I think helps those who preach, for example, in the open air, is to, trans is to transition in their mind. All these people that are walking around are immortal souls that are perishing and who don't know Christ and who don't have the gospel. And that ought to be a force that overrides all of the other inhibitions to keep the gospel from them. Well, if you can grasp that, and everyone here can grasp that, there's something similar even within our, 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 our own callings as just Christians, right? You have, a, you have a sibling or you have a cousin or someone else that's, that's unconverted. It's difficult, especially for those who are close to us, you know, people that we've grown up with, people that know us well. But we, we have people that we're very comfortable and familiar with who don't know the gospel, who aren't Christians. And there's all sorts of inhibition that, that affects our ability. We can talk to them about everything in the world, but about the thing that's most important. And what I'm, what I'm pressing upon you is this, thinking about them as souls, fishers of men, is a, is a motivation that pushes us, as it were, over our inhibitions to say, I'm going to die to self and love this person enough to be personally uncomfortable, perhaps, in order to communicate to them something that they desperately need to hear. The second thing I would press on you <clears throat> is this. Do you believe God is able to convert people? Well, everyone here is going to say yes. You know, after all, we're Calvinists, we're Reformed. Of course God is able to convert people. Everyone here is going to say, <clears throat> I know evangelism is important. I don't know of anybody in our congregation that objects to open-air preaching on Fridays and so on and so forth. Everyone here knows about the reality of the, the judgment to come. And you don't need your minister to stand up and preach hellfire and brimstone in order to reinforce those things with you. But I wonder if, if it's helpful to think what is going on behind the scenes in my own mind? So I believe God is able to convert people. But perhaps some of us think, 
myself included at times, I know it is true, but I haven't seen it that much. So deep down, there's a lingering doubt, as it were. It's not like we're, you're seeing tons of people converted on every side. And maybe here it's good for us to just go back to our Bibles. Maybe it's good for us. We've been reading through the book of Acts here on Wednesday evenings, and that's a great place to go. And you read through the book of Acts and allow it to sink in. This is who God is. This is what God does. And this is what sets our expectations. Knowing who he is and what he does. Perhaps it's helpful for you to read church history. You know, you take down a, a, a volume and read through the, the work in the, the 19th century, you know, mid-19th century and the beginning of the free church and the numbers of conversions that were happening at that time or in Northern Ireland in the 1850s or here in the U.S. under Edwards and so on in the 1740s. And these are obviously high days in which the Spirit is being poured out in extraordinary measure, but still it's a means of bolstering and strengthening our confidence and raising our expectations for what exactly we're asking the Lord to do, what we desire Him to do. So Jesus is saying we are to follow Him because He makes us fishers of, of men. The worship of God is the centerpiece in the world in history all the time. And the Lord uses that to get glory for himself. He uses it to save sinners and the conversion of sinners. He uses it to nurture his people. And we need to be prepared to encourage people to come under the preaching of God's word and the gospel within the church. So that's a, that's a priority. Perhaps a practical priority that's associated with that is our reception of those who come. You know, it would be a good habit if every single person in this congregation, young people included, made it a habit on every Lord's Day to stand up and look around and identify who's visiting and for everybody to take a sense of responsibility and go in and reach out to them and build in bridges and giving a warm reception so that there's opportunity uh, both then or in the future, uh, to speak to them about the things of the Lord, whether they're converted or not, of course. But the, the gospel is not confined to the preaching of God's word to God's people on the Sabbath. You will find no warrant for that in the scriptures. And so there's got to be a sense as well of outward-looking built into the compass of our minds where we're thinking constantly about our community, about our nation, and about the work of foreign missions. God said, go. He didn't say, stay. He says, go. We're to take the gospel. So the vast majority of people that are alienated from Christ will have zero interest in attending church. If all we're going to do is wait for some people to somehow stumble into here, there are going to be very few that are reached. Jesus says, go. We have to take the gospel to them where they are. And this is what Jesus is, is calling us to. So as we as a congregation shift into this new season and new setting, uh, it is good for us to be refreshed about the priority to who the church is, the priority with regards to our obligations to take the gospel to others. Jesus saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let's stand for prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we confess that you are the Lord of glory and that you are the sovereign who is pleased to bring to pass your holy will. We thank you, O Lord, that you have not confessed contained the gospel in Jerusalem, but that you sent that gospel through Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, so that we who live so very far from where the gospel was first preached, and we who are Gentiles, 
on a different continent could be recipients of that gospel ourselves. Uh, give us, O oh Lord, grace first and foremost to follow you, to follow the Lord Jesus day by day. And then we pray that you would also give us grace to speak about what is most precious to us, uh, that we might lift up our little whispers uh, to perishing sinners uh, who need a savior. And so we pray, fortify us, bless us as a congregation, brighten, O Lord, our testimony, grant that our candlestick would not be hidden under a bushel, that it would be set high, high, high upon a stand, and that as you give us breath and strength in this brief pilgrimage, that we would cause that light to shine as brightly as possible, and that Christ would be lifted up, drawing many sinners unto himself. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by singing from Psalm 67, the first version of Psalm 67. The tune is Gerlach Side, number 164. After a sermon on this topic, this psalm is almost predictable for most of us. It is a psalm in which we are asking God to take his saving grace to the nations. It's, as I often say, an inspired missionary hymn. Lord, bless and pity us, shine on us with thy face, that the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. Let people praise thee, Lord. Let people all thee praise, O let the nations be glad in songs their voices raise. We'll sing the first version of Psalm 67. Stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.